Okay, hi everyone. We're going to talk about uh, oral facial clefts for this chapter, chapter 61 in Darby and Walsh. And these are the specific course um, objectives to discuss the incidence, prevalence, and etiology of oral facial clefts and differentiate between the types of treatment indicated for lip and palatal clefts to educate patients and caregivers about the risks and oral complications for patients with oral facial clefts, describe the dental hygienist's role in planning individualized dental hygiene care to address prevention and treatment of oral health conditions, and challenges associated with cleft lip and cleft palate, and discuss the importance of interprofessional collaboration to address the multitude of needs of a patient with oral facial clefts of the patient's caregiver, or the patient's caregiver, sorry. So oral facial clefts is the failure of lip or and or it can be either one um, or it can be both palatal tissue to close during embryonic development. It's a congenital anomaly and it can be expressed as a cleft palate only, a cleft lip only, or a combination of the cleft lip and the cleft palate. So it's the most prevalent birth defect in the US. It affects um, upwards of 7,000 infants per year. And it's most common among Asians or those of Asian ancestry. African-Americans have the lowest prevalence among all ethnic groups of clefts. And then it's more prominent among males than females at a three um, to two ratio. And boys are more likely to have a cleft involving both a lip and the palate, and girls are mo more likely to have a cleft palate without the cleft lip. So here are a few famous people um, who you may recognize who have um, an oral facial cleft. So Cheech Marin, he um, did a, a Cheech and Chong movie that was really popular years and years ago, kind of an iconic figure um, for like a what do they call movies that are like um oh shoot I can't think of what they call movies that like everybody has to go see and and it lasts the generations oh shoot the, the word left me but anyways he's um someone that you'd have to go back and look at um his old movie Cheech and Chong and then Joaquin Phoenix a lot of people recognize him he's done lots of popular movies and then Peyton Manning a football player um so there's just a handful of some people and um you can kind of see their scars a little bit you can see it more on Joaquin I think um and a little bit on Peyton there but you can kind of see their their scars after um, having uh, surgery. So oral facial clefts um, is failure of the lip and or palate to close during embryonic development and characteristics, it results from a malformation or a um, deformation or a disruption in one or more parts of the body. It is present at birth <clears throat> and it um, has serious adverse um, effects for developmental and functional ability. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those are. <clears throat> so clefts associated with other birth de defects or syndromes. There's more than 300 um, syndromes that can result in a cleft palate or cleft lip, but most are very rare. So if it's a non-syndrome related oral facial cleft, it could be genetics or family history, and, or it could be environmental. So lack of prenatal care and instruction. If the mom smokes, if they're not taking enough folic acid, which is incredibly important during pregnancy, some other nutritional deficiencies, if they are taking some kind of recreational drug or maybe even a prescribed drug that, that causes birth defects that they're unaware of. Um, so teratogenic agents, um, vasoactive or anticonvulsant medications such as phenytoin, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and vasoconstrictors, et cetera, can all um, have teratogenic um, effects on the fetus, potentially leading to a cleft. In addition, isolated clefts may be caused by an interaction between an individual's genetic predisposition and environmental factors. Um, 
I'm just reading the notes here, see if it says anything different. Another environmental factor that may contribute to a higher risk of an infant developing an oral facial cleft is the ingestion of drugs. We already said that. Oh, okay. So here we have some pictures. The formation of the lip is the fifth week in utero and a lack of fusion of the medial nasal and maxillary processes that form the philtrum is what leads to this um, cleft lip. Cleft lip. Uh, the formation of the palate is between week five and week 12 um, in utero and cells do not penetrate the grooves between the medial nasal and maxillary processes. Primary and secondary development separately may occur at different locations and at different times. But one major thing to kind of take away from this is the lip formation is the fifth week in utero. Some women don't even know they're pregnant in the fifth week in utero. So you can see how environmental factors could significantly play a role um, if a woman is doing drugs or is not healthy and doesn't even realize that they're pregnant. Severity ranges from least severe, which is an incomplete unilateral cleft lip, to most severe, which is a complete bilateral cleft lip and cleft palate. Um, Incomplete cleft lip is a notch of any depth that involves the philtrum, and it does not invade the hard structure or the nostrils. So any kind um, of uh, a separation in the philtrum, but it doesn't go into any kind of hard structures. A unilateral or bilateral cleft lip um, is a lack of fusion of the median nasal and maxillary processes. Um, and that's what you can see. It's on both sides, unilateral. A complete cleft lip involves the alveolar bone and the primary plate and extends into the nostrils. And this is a complete bilateral. So it's totally into hard structure on both sides and into the nostrils. A complete cleft palate involves the anterior primary palate is anterior to the incisive foramen and posterior secondary palate. It extends posterior to the incisive foramen and involves the hard and the soft palate. So this is kind of weird because they have a mirror reflecting so you can see um, so you can see the palate. So it's kind of I think we're looking I think the actual palette's up here and we're looking at a, at a mirror here. So it's a little bit weird to look at this, <clears throat> but you can see how the, the palette's totally open and it goes into the soft palette as well. Um, a cleft palette only, just, um, just an opening in the palette and then a complete bilateral cleft palette again. You can see again, it's into the nose, the nostrils, the, the palette's totally open and it probably goes into the soft as well. And then this is just um, a clef of the uvula. You can see how the uvula is bifurcated here and here. So it's just a soft palate and the uvula. And then a submucosal clef, um, there's a cleft in the bone, but the tissue has covered it. So lacks muscle or bone fusion, yet the soft tissue is present. So they'd still need to go in and do surgery there, but there is some kind of a barrier. So now we'll talk about treatments a little bit. So after the baby has been born, they may do a, tr a tr surgery for the lip between six and 18 weeks. So pretty early. Um, and then they'll do a surgery for the soft palate between six and 18 months. So a little bit older and then hard palate four to five years. So they're going to wait um, a little bit more for the hard palate because that would be a much more severe surgery. Um, some other temporary or possible um, treatment options would be an abturator. We've talked a lot about these for um, patients who have had different various surgeries, maybe can oral cancer, and then orthodontics. Uh, there's going to be malocclusion, possibly missing teeth, and then restorative dentistry, again, for the same reason, missing teeth potentially, 
um, higher risk of decay, and we'll talk about why that is. So oral facial clefts are treatable, but the extent of treatment varies per case. Lips can be treated as early as possible, but soft palate repair, typically six to 18 months. Cosmetic surgery, reconstructive surgery, or orthognathic surgery, which involves corrective surgery of the jaw and face to alter the relationship of the teeth and supporting bones, sometimes in conjunction with orthodontic treatment, may be indicated as secondary surgeries after the primary oral facial cleft surgery if maxillary deficiencies, malocclusion, and lip and nasal deformities result. So they may need the the main takeaway here from those notes is that they may need more than one surgery. If it's really a major cleft of the hard tissues, they may, may need the initial surgery just to close it. And then they may need um, cosmetic surgeries or other kinds of surgeries to help get their teeth in function and alignment and cosmetic you know, preferences. Oh, goodness. So here's a whole bunch of information here. So interprofessional approach, somebody who has a clef, it's going to take a lot of various uh, healthcare professionals working together, um, potentially. I mean, I don't think everybody on this list is going to be involved in everybody's situation, but these are the possible interprofessional aspects. It takes a huge group of specialists to manage an oral facial clef. This list is not one or the other, but often all of these spe specialists have to play their part at one point or another, so they may come at different times. Obviously, with simpler clefts or just the lip, the list is much shorter. Dental hygienists also play a role, especially with a young patient who has not had surgery or his or her heart, um, on his or her hard palate. In addition to delivering clinical dental hygiene services, dental hygienists can participate in interprofessional teams by providing oral screenings and examinations, risk assessments and management, and oral health education to support groups for patients and caregivers. Dental hygienists can offer professional continuing education opportunities for groups of oral other health care providers involved in the treatment of individuals with cleft lips and palates to enhance their awareness of the risk factors for oral disease. Uh, prevention of caries and periodontal disease, oral hygiene methods recommended for their patients. Um, oh, my notes are, hold on. Okay, it went away. <laughs> okay, so where was I? Um, oral hygiene methods recommended for their patients with oral facial clefts and the importance of frequent oral health care visits. So this, the notes here are basically saying that we have an opportunity to really work collaboratively with other healthcare professionals, and we can also educate them on our specialty bit of information, what we know about um, oral hygiene and caring for um, patients who are at higher risk for disease because of whatever situation they have, whether it be a physical anomaly or medication or, you know, whatever it is. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, an audiologist doesn't, isn't going to know what we know um, about the oral health of a patient with a cleft. And we're not going to know what an audiologist knows in regards to a patient with a cleft. Um, oral and physical complications. So there are feeding difficulties as infants. And this is one of probably the biggest initial concerns um, because obviously babies need to be well nourished. So difficulty creating a negative pressure to bottle or breastfeed, nasal regurgitation, long feeding times, difficult um, difficulty sucking, excessive inhalation of air, um, requiring frequent burping. And if anybody's had a baby, they know that you want to minimize air. So if these babies have excessive air, they might have more tummy aches. They might be more fussy. It's harder for them to latch and get a good suck. So their feeding is just going to be slower and more difficult. Tooth development, missing or supernumerary teeth, congenitally missing, lateral and canines, missing or displaced, supernumerary teeth, morphologically deformed teeth, they may not 
form normally. Hypoplastic, um, which is thin, missing, or underdeveloped enamel, and then hypermineralized, which is decreased, hypomineralized, excuse me, which is decreased mineral content of the enamel. Uh, malocclusion, so uh, patient may warrant uh, orthodontia afterwards. Cleft palates are the most common for needing um, orthodontia or having malocclusion. Commonly developed class three malocclusion results from missing teeth and a stunted maxillary growth. So class three, when the jaw protrudes beyond the maxilla, usually we have, you know, our anterior maxillary anterior teeth come first, right? Class three, the, the bottom jaw protrudes, and that's because they may have a stunted maxillary growth. There can be nasal deformities, problems with hearing and speech, palatal muscles um, control the opening of the eustachian tubes. So without ventilation, ventilating the fluid accumulates in the middle ear and bacteria from the nasal pharynx multiply to cause acute infections. So chronic ear infections, um, chronic infections can impair hearing and then hypernasal speech due to air escaping through the nose. So it's going to affect the quality, the tone, the sound of their, their voice. Uh, health and teeth and periodontum carries mouth breathing malposition. So the health of their teeth and their periodontium. In children with oral facial clefts, the most common problem is a middle ear infection from a lack of ventilation from the eustachian tubes because the palatal muscles control the opening of these tubes. Like I, this is just reading the notes here. Chronic ear infections can result in hearing impairments from the permanent damage to the auditory sensory nerves if the problem is not addressed. Hearing problems contribute significantly to speech disorders common in persons with oral facial clefts. So one thing affects the other. You can see how speech, hearing, and oral health, um, nutrition, it can, you know, it can be a major, a major problem. I'm gonna open my fizzy water, so excuse the, the noise, the can. Okay. Um, Psychosocial considerations, obviously they could be self-conscious, hypersensitive, um, they look different from most people, so they may be very feeling very um, feeling of inferiority, uh, quiet, withdrawn, unresponsive, without rapport and trust, feeling very shy, maybe embarrassed, low self-esteem, fear, apprehension, knowing that, you know, maybe what's up, up they're facing is uh, is surgery, and that can be very scary. Parents may be afraid of hurting the child while providing oral hygiene. You know, parents don't recognize the oral structures that their child has. They look different from their own, and until they get used to them and understand what they can and can't do, it can be scary for the parents as well. High risk of caries, so 3.5 times more decay surfaces. Um, prevalence of caries more often in the primary dentition, maxillary incisors, teeth adjacent to the cleft and the molars. The contributing factors to the high caries risk are due to longer time to clear food from the oral cavity. To the tenacious na um, nature of the nasal fluid promotes adherence of biofilm. So they have this open passage to the nasal path, the nasal area, which, you know, there's mucus and all this. And so that, those two environments coming together is not a good thing for oral health. It makes the biofilm adhere more. Insufficient parental dietary counseling, insufficient education about a toothbrushing technique, coping with a baby with cleft, and poor accessibility of toothbrush around the cleft area, soft food consumption, retention and increased acid production, orthodontic appliances, abturators have a 7.6 times higher incidence of caries by two and a half years old. So if a young child has to wear an oral appliance, they are far more likely to have decay, which is very sad. Patients with a cleft palate have a higher caries risk because of a longer oral clearance, time for food, more fermentable sugars from starches and the tenacious nature of nasal fluid, which promotes the adherence of oral biofilm. Other factors contributing to increased caries risk include insufficient dietary counseling, oral hygiene, trauma, coping with a baby with cleft palate, poor accessibility um, of toothbrushing around a cleft. 
just repeated this whole slide again for you. That's okay. Um, okay, oral hygiene care, demineralization, systemic and topical fluoride therapy is um, encouraged. Dental sealants is encouraged. Xylitol containing products, um, our bath sulcular or the phones technique for brushing, power toothbrush and a small brush head, um, especially something small that can get around all the different areas and in intricate little areas that there may be, inner dental cleaning, cleaning intraoral speech prosthesis and abturators. So that's very important too. May require more frequent um, hygiene appointments as well. Anticipatory guidance, uh, parental counseling, how to prevent early childhood caries, frequent cleaning appointments, communication problems, and hearing difficulties. Those would all be the main concerns. And that is the end of that lesson. So I'm going to stop recording here and you guys all have a great rest of your day.